Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight, outrage continues over government's burial of unidentified Hurricane Dorian victims. One week down for the Bimini lockdown, how residents are doing. Plus, one pastor slams conditions for church services. News is brought to you by Alive. Welcome to Our News and thank you for joining us. I'm Kyle Joaquin. Days after emotions ran high during the burial of 55 Hurricane Dorian victims, Member of Parliament for Central and South Africa, James Aubrey, has asked Prime Minister Dr. Hubert Minnis to launch an inquiry into the process and its timeliness. However, some critics say that request is too little too late. Berthney McDermott has more. Some Abaco residents are up in arms over a letter penned by Central and South Abaco MP James Albury to the Prime Minister following the burial of 55 Hurricane Dorian victims on Friday. The letter, dated May 23rd, reads, Sir, I would be remiss if I did not request that a formal inquiry into the eighth to nine-month process and the timeliness of this procedure be looked into by the appropriate agencies. It continues, I feel a review of this is not only imperative for the families of Abaco, but also for the proper handling of any future mass casualty events, God forbid. However, one resident said, too little, too late. Another said, so MP Albury, you've been out to lunch for the past six months? As MP for the district, you were mandated to be an integral part of the process. Now you're asking the Prime Minister that question? Central Abaco Local Government Chief Councillor George Corner says there are a number of questions that Abaconians need answered. Somebody needs to be accountable for what has happened. Um, if it's the government, if it's an individual, or whoever it is, the people of Abaco needs to know. So there should be an investigation. He's right about that. There should be an investigation as to how this all took place. Cornish also expressed his dissatisfaction with Friday's ecumenical service, adding that he decided to leave once it was revealed that family members were not allowed to attend the ceremony. I would have thought that they would have put some tents around the grave site where family members, some six or eight members per family would be able to attend. That didn't happen. So people were grieving and wasn't even able to get close to see their loved ones, um, even though they didn't know who was in the coffins um, buried. That didn't sit too well with me. I couldn't support that, so I left. Meantime, Progressive Liberal Party Chairman Fred Mitchell is calling for Aubrey to resign due to rules laid out by the Westminster system. The cabinet made a decision that that was supposed to take place. It was being executed by the government, of which he is a part, he, the parliamentary secretary. And he writes a letter which indicates, either directly or by implication, that he disagrees with what happened. So you have to ask yourself, how is it possible for him given the nature of our system, to maintain his tenure as a parliamentary secretary, that having happened. Mitchell added that it is clear that Albury is under pressure from his constituents. Finally, after all of these months, the member parliament for Abaco and the parliamentary secretary in the office of the prime minister has suddenly found his voice. Reporting for Our News, I'm Berthony McDermott. Well, the wife of a man who has been missing since Hurricane Dorian devastated Abaco eight months ago is angry with government's decision to bury 55 storm victims before they were identified. The grieving widow told Jared Hakes she is positive that her spouse of 21 years was in the trailer with the 54 other victims. And my husband is not a um, number. His name is James Ricardo Capron. He's not an item. He's a human. Days after a mass burial for 55 unidentified Hurricane Dorian victims, many families are outraged at government over the way their loved ones' burials have been handled. The funeral was marked with protests, with many angry families being kept at a distance due to social distancing guidelines. 52-year-old Merlene Capron and her family believed that her husband, 49-year-old James Ricardo Capron, perished in the storm. However, his body has never been positively identified. I never gave the government permission to bury my husband. My husband has his wife, his mother, 
his father, his sisters, and brothers. We don't need the government to bury my husband. Capron is blasting government over its slow handling of the identification process. She says her husband's sister submitted a DNA sample months ago, but they have not gotten word since. She says nobody has been in contact with them, and it has been up to them to follow up with authorities. However, she has no doubt that her husband was in the infamous coal trailer in Marsh Harbor. That's my husband because his body was decomposed. People who knew him found him. They took the picture and sent it to us here. You understand me? That's clearly my husband. His sister have the picture. I can't look at it. His boss knew that was him. Authorities previously stated that the severely decomposed state of some remains made it difficult for DNA samples to be collected and processed. However, yesterday, a police official said that a new lab was selected to analyze the samples, but its priority has shifted due to the pandemic. Still, the grieving woman says the decision to bury the dead without involving the families was disrespectful. My husband's wish was for him to criminate. He told me specifically and his mom. Yes, sir. It wasn't. It was acknowledged and respected. It was inhumane, sir. Should happen. Should never happen. Government never contacted me and I never give the government permission to bury my husband, sir. The couple met through a mutual friend and were married for 21 years. They have a 16-year-old son together. Capron worked in Abaco as a security guard at the time of his death. His wife described him as a great person. You know, very nice man, very nice person. He give his last, man. He always encouraged people to do their best, man, to do their best. My husband teach, taught me a lot. He opened my eyes to the impossibilities, man, you know. Now, the 52-year-old is left to fend for herself without her soulmate. Now, Capron says she wants her husband's DNA test to come back so that she can hopefully get a death certificate. She says it's an important part of getting closure. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. Well, the president of the Funeral Directors Association is defending Friday's burial in Abaco, which has been widely criticized. This, as another funeral director says, the identification process has been flawed for months. Everyone is astonished to see, to hear, after the fact, that now certain things are being said. And there is no denying that. The fact of the matter is, this matter should have been handled in a better way. Wendell Dean was one of the first morticians on the island of Abaco, post-Dorian, and said once the process began of recovering bodies and storing them, there was order in place, even down to the first set of DNA samples taken. However, he said after he left the island in late September, as more and more bodies were found, it was clear structure was lacking. For starters, he said most of the bodies found had some sort of identification on them, which begs the question, what happened? There were persons who had their identifications on them when we, when we processed them. They had identifications on them. So there should have been an announcement made for those persons' family to come in and verify. Mm -hmm. I heard no announcements reference to that. Family members and friends who protested outside the burial service said they weren't given an opportunity to offer DNA samples, while some took issue with the bodies being buried as they await results from a lab outside of the country. The Disaster Reconstruction Authority has said labs have shifted their priorities due to the COVID-19 pandemic, so it remains unclear when those results would come in. But funeral directors like Dean also took issue with how the burial was handled. While most of the caskets were lowered on Friday with no issue, there were at least two unfortunate incidents. Dean called it a lack of professionalism. There were a lot of missteps. And missteps happen because there's no proper supervision. Bahamas United Funeral Homes and Morticians Association President Chris Ferguson was one of the directors at Friday's burial. While he admits there were some hiccups, he insisted workers were professional. Those who are most unfortunate, uh, I do, uh, as I did yesterday, offer a humble apology, and I do so again today. Um, those things oftentimes happen at public interments, also private interments, where we encounter situations with variables in the graves, and we have to call upon our construction workers or the grave diggers to assist. Uh, what was captured on camera was one of those instances where personnel who were called upon to render assistance based on the challenges we face with the grave uh, did come forward. However, in their lowering the casket, one of the ends ran down sooner than the other. The ordeal has sparked outrage on social media, with many calling it a lack of respect for the deceased and their families. However, Ferguson insists the dignity of the deceased was always taken into consideration, right down to casket selection. Based on the circumstances, those caskets were what are called 20-gauge uh, hermetically sealed caskets. 
uh, the sealer units were chosen because of the condition of the bodies and also because there's an ongoing, um, I would call, investigation as to the identity of persons in those caskets. In other news, with one week left in their mandatory lockdown, Bimini residents say they're coping the best way they know how. Jillian Gray reports. It's been one week since Bimini residents have been on full lockdown. While some say they've found ways to pass the time, others are just eager to get back to work. Well, the kids are still um, attending virtual school. A lot of people on the island, you know, they live at or below the poverty line, so, so their needs are, you, you know, I don't know, Ms. Gray, you could imagine for, for a person who struggles to get day by day, you know, two weeks is a lot, you know, and, you know, our biggest, biggest infrastructure is our tourism and our water, a lot of, you know, the bottles and divers aren't, aren't allowed to go out, so it, it is a little struggle. The mandatory two-week lockdown is in response to the 13 confirmed cases on that island. Bimini resident Joman Jones said they haven't had tourists since March, which makes it difficult for the tourist destination. With the start of hurricane season just days away, he said residents need to prepare, adding the possibility of a 14-day lockdown extension will not sit well with many. I don't think it's needed. Our, our clinic has, has not been overrun. You know, a lot of persons, this, this virus was limited to four home stops, you know, and we don't think it's needed, you know, time to get back to work. Jones added that in a matter of days, many ran out of food. Sherelle Saunders, who volunteers with a local group on the island, said she and others have had to make multiple runs for people who need food and water. There were at least 50 homes in need, and by the week's end, there were hundreds they had to assist. Hot meals, propane gas, and toiletries were also in great demand. We are restocking the pantry as we speak, and we also have a NASA boat. Captain Emmett, as well as the Sea Corps, will be in this week with more items to put into the pantry. So I'm sure we'll be very well for this week, and I know that more homes will be needing assistance. During this period, Saunders said medical professionals have been calling to check in on the sick and conducting home visits to take medication. Reporting for our news, I'm Jillian Gray. All right, thanks, Jillian. Still to come, Chester Cooper questions the terms of an emergency loan facility. Plus, a pastor slams new church service conditions. Stay tuned. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a new coronavirus introduced to humans for the first time. It is spread from person to person, mainly through the droplets produced when an infected person speaks, coughs or sneezes. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby. These droplets are too heavy to travel far in the air. They only travel approximately one metre and quickly settle on surfaces. This is the reason person-to-person -person spread is happening mainly between close contacts. The exact time that the virus can survive on surfaces is not yet known. So it is wise to clean surfaces regularly, particularly in the vicinity of people infected with COVID-19. Hands touch many surfaces, which can be contaminated with the virus. You should therefore avoid touching your eyes, nose or mouth, since contaminated hands can transfer the virus from the surface to yourself. When coughing or sneezing, cover your mouth and nose with the bend of your elbow or use a disposable tissue. If a tissue is used, discard it immediately into a closed bin. The most effective way to prevent the spread of the new coronavirus is to clean your hands frequently with an alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. This will eliminate the virus if it is on your hands. Stay healthy and prevent the spread of COVID-19. A local pastor is calling for an explanation from the government on specific conditions outlined for worship services on your Providence and other islands. He called on fellow church leaders to take a stand. With more on this, here's Georgia Bain. Pastor Christopher Roberts says he believes that the government has gone too far in its dictating of what the church can and cannot do. And now he's calling on local pastors to, quote, 
grow some balls and let their voices be heard. In this modern day Bahamas, I'll be damned if I'm going to sit by and allow the government to walk in and tell the church what it's going to do and I'd be quiet. I might be a loner, but I will be alone. But I, my voice, will be heard and say that this is not right and it cannot happen. One day after churches across the island held drive-up services in accordance with the new conditions outlined by the Prime Minister on Friday, Pastor Roberts is questioning the restrictions that remain in place and calling on the Prime Minister to explain the rationale behind them. One hour is given to the church for worship. But the bar room and those other places are open from 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 in the evening. There is no restriction that you could only serve your stuff for an hour. But the church, which is an essential service in this country, whether we want to, as a matter of fact, it's, it's an essential service in the world. What is the scientific that you keep saying? What is the scientific reason why these particular measures would have been brought into place? In a statement on social media, Robert said the government is attempting to give permission in areas that reach beyond its authority. He added that Friday's announcement leads him to believe that the government is losing respect for church leaders. A few weeks ago, the, the, the Christian Council submitted to the government a proposal for the reopening of church. I was advised that to date, the, the government has yet to respond to the Christian Council on, the, on that proposal. The first thing they heard was what was sent on Friday. So, so in other words, if I am to read that, I am to read that the government is saying to the Christian Council, man, the hell with y'all, I on y'all, right? Let me tell y'all what we're going to do. Roberts called on pastors, regardless of their political affiliation, to speak up in the face of what he termed a direct insult to the Christian church. Roberts implored church leaders to grow some balls and let their voices be heard. This is our religious responsibility. This is our Christian conviction. And if we're not prepared to stand up for it, if we're not prepared to fight for it, if we're not prepared to die for it, if we're not prepared to lose our jobs for it, if we're not prepared to lose our concessions and our subventions for it, then we might as well leave the pulpit. Reporting for our news, I'm Georgie O'Bain. Progressive Liberal Party Deputy Leader Chester Cooper is questioning the government's application for a $252 million financing facility from the International Monetary Fund. Finance Minister Peter Turnquist confirmed that the loan facility will be used to support Hurricane Dorian and COVID-19 programs for the rest of the fiscal year. Cooper said it raises several questions and insisted the public must be assured that no implicit or explicit conditions exist. IMF borrowing obviously comes with much concern from the public. The interest rate is very low. They say it's no strings attached. And we know that we have a scenario where public confidence is low in this government. So the public will want to see the details of the term sheet and the loans agreement. Uh, the opposition will demand that these agreements be laid on the table. The government's nine-month snapshot shows that the Minnesota administration had already borrowed approximately $936 million to fund its budgetary operations this fiscal year. The Deputy Prime Minister will deliver the 2020-2021 budget communication to Parliament on Wednesday. Cooper said he's not optimistic. We anticipate that the government must give account for the monies raised or donated for her in Durham, the lack of progress in Abaco, the lack of progress in Grand Bahama, as well as the uh, lackluster response to the COVID crisis. Well, after more than 10 years of offering high-end dining experiences, Luciano's restaurant has closed its doors permanently. The company said in a statement, due to the current economic climate, the restaurant's reliance on the tourist market and the economic uncertainty in the coming, in the coming months, it is unable to continue as a viable business. The statement continues, the sad reality is that the restaurant industry operates on very slim margins, and Luciano's was no exception. The owners and management team have been struggling to make ends meet for the last couple of years and have exhausted every avenue to keep the restaurant open and to keep the team employed. Luciano thanked customers and its team for their support over the years. Still to come, Rev launches a new concierge service. The details after this break. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a new coronavirus introduced to humans for the first time. It is spread from person to person, mainly through the droplets produced when an infected person speaks, coughs or sneezes. 
These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby. These droplets are too heavy to travel far in the air. They only travel approximately one metre and quickly settle on surfaces. This is the reason person-to-person -person spread is happening mainly between close contacts. The exact time that the virus can survive on surfaces is not yet known. So it is wise to clean surfaces regularly, particularly in the vicinity of people infected with COVID-19. Hands touch many surfaces, which can be contaminated with the virus. You should therefore avoid touching your eyes, nose or mouth, since contaminated hands can transfer the virus from the surface to yourself. When coughing or sneezing, cover your mouth and nose with the bend of your elbow or use a disposable tissue. If a tissue is used, discard it immediately into a closed bin. The most effective way to prevent the spread of the new coronavirus is to clean your hands frequently with an alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. This will eliminate the virus if it is on your hands. Stay healthy and prevent the spread of COVID-19. You're watching our news. Welcome back. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has forced companies to change the way they do business, Rev has launched concierge services at its headquarters. Head of residential sales and loyalty Rory Major says Rev Concierge makes the customer experience easier and more convenient. Customers are able to upgrade their services to Trio with very minimal contact thanks to the new curbside service. They don't have to come out their car. They, when they arrive here, they, they, let, they let us know via text message that they're here. What, what, what color car do they ha they're in? We wear gloves. We have our mask on. We actually give them their, their, their um, supplies, as you can see right here. And it's a self-install. You actually can, if they have any issues, they would call 601-2200 with our technical team. Major encouraged customers to call Reb at 810-0553 or email residential sales at cablebahamas.com. He also revealed that Reb is giving cash back to 200 customers. We're giving now to 200 customers $100 to watch their bill. So if you pay your bill in full, sign up for my account, you actually get a chance to win $100 credit towards your bill. It is, it's, it's just giving back. We've added numerous channels, right? For the, for the kids, we understand the, the times we're in and the times we're living in. But we want to we show our customers that we're truthfully here for them. Still to come, a track legend considering a comeback. Stay tuned. COVID-19 is an infectious disease caused by a new coronavirus introduced to humans for the first time. It is spread from person to person, mainly through the droplets produced when an infected person speaks, coughs or sneezes. These droplets can land in the mouths or noses of people who are nearby. These droplets are too heavy to travel far in the air. They only travel approximately one metre and quickly settle on surfaces. This is the reason person-to-person -person spread is happening mainly between close contacts. The exact time that the virus can survive on surfaces is not yet known. So it is wise to clean surfaces regularly, particularly in the vicinity of people infected with COVID-19. Hands touch many surfaces, which can be contaminated with the virus. You should therefore avoid touching your eyes, nose or mouth, since contaminated hands can transfer the virus from the surface to yourself. When coughing or sneezing, cover your mouth and nose with the bend of your elbow or use a disposable tissue. If a tissue is used, discard it immediately into a closed bin. The most effective way to prevent the spread of the new coronavirus is to clean your hands frequently with an alcohol-based hand rub or soap and water. This will eliminate the virus if it is on your hands. Stay healthy and prevent the spread of COVID-19. Finally in news tonight, a local track legend talks balancing coaching and a potential return to competition. Marcellus Hall reports. Well, the postponement of the 2020 Olympic Games has had a different effect on different athletes. For the younger ones, it's just another year to wait. 
with a lot of time on their agenda. Meanwhile, for the older athletes who are on their last hurrahs, this could have a very different type of effect. We caught up with one of those older athletes, Chris Brown, who's thinking about making a comeback and had a conversation about this and more. It's a huge adjustment, you know, um, just being able to balance um, so many different things and, you know, having to shut everything down so fast and so abrupt. Uh, for me, you know, training and also uh, coaching at the same time, you know, it's, it, it, it was kind of uh, a wake up call for the body to say, you know, hey, you've been going for this long and, you know, now having to experience something new and having to shut that down, you know, it's like, it's like, I don't know how to explain it, but it's just, it's different, you know. For you, that's got to be huge because especially this year with the Olympics now being pushed back another year, is that good or is that bad for you? It's actually a good balance for me and it also helps me with my recovery because after running track for 20 years, you know, um, my body needed a break, you know, and so the, the year and a half that I was absent from the track and field world, it actually helped my body to feel like it can go another four years versus, hey, I'm on the tail end, I, I don't have anything else to give, you know, and so the, the, the rest for the last year and a half, it actually did my body well. So and now coming back you now and having another year to really recover, I think I probably feel like uh, 26 again or 21 again. <laughs> as, a college, as a college coach now, obviously, um, track season interrupted, uh, your whole program interrupted. How are you now adjusting to that part of it and keeping your athletes focused for whenever things resume to normalcy? This year, as being a head coach, um, I had to basically stay in my role and know my, where my position was, which was the assist. So now I'm the head coach. I've set the bar. They know how high I've set the bar and what the standard is and what, the, what they need to do to improve within that bar. And so they saw that this year they came out ready, but they didn't come with that same fire that I was looking for. And so this gives them an opportunity to go back to the drawing board and do it all over again, or know, at least know what to expect, getting back into practice, come hopefully everything returns to normal in August. But um, as, for, as for me, um, I'm, 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 just, I'm just grateful that I have the opportunity to, do, to coach and to also compete, you know, and I'm looking forward to it. And, of course, we'll keep an eye on Chris on both his coaching side and, of course, his athletic side in the near future. Meanwhile, so much more to come. I'm Marcellus Hall for our news. Weather update is brought to you by Generali. Your health means the world to us. Thank you for joining us for Our News tonight. On behalf of the entire team, I'm Kyle Joaquin. Remember, you can catch Our News on the Go with the Ref Go Play app. Have a good Monday evening, Homer.